Talat de Jardin is a name we've mentioned before. He was a Jesuit priest that was involved in a number of things. He's a French Jesuit priest. He's a eugenicist, Marxist, pantheist, evolutionist. He was heavily involved in the 1912 forgery that was called Piltdown Man. He's a humanist and a proponent of a one world government. And he's also known as the father of the new age. He's a Jesuit priest that's pushing the new age, driving the new ages into something that they're not really aware of. Robert Mueller, uh, uh, secretary of the general secretary of the United Nations, he wrote in his book, Most of All They Taught Me Happiness. It says, any Tile Hardian will recognize in this the spiritual transcendence which he announced so emphatically as the next step in our evolution. Here, Teilhard de Jardin is explaining that the next level of evolution is this one world coming together, this new level of spirituality as we spiraling towards Godhood. Not only that, Dave Hunt explains that Teilhard dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own Godhood at the Omega point. This belief has inspired many of today's New Age leaders. Talhard's own quotes were quite are quite interesting to read. They go, it is a law of the universe that in all things there is prior existence. No, it's not. I disagree. He continues, before every form there is a prior but lesser evolved form. Each one of us is evolving towards the Godhead. I believe that the Messiah whom we await, whom we all without any doubt await, is the universal Christ. That is to say, the Christ of evolution. Do you remember from the evolution lecture who the Christ of evolution was? If you don't know what I'm speaking about, please go and read uh, or, or, or watch the DVD on Sun versus Sun, S-O-N versus S-U-N, the evolution debate. Talat de Jardin says we are evolving into Godhood and we are now waiting for the Christ of evolution. Robert Mueller had some interesting things to say. He was a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. Decide to open yourself to God, he says, to the universe, to all your brethren and sisters, to your inner self, to the potential of the human race, to the infinity of your inner self, and you will become the universe. You will become infinity, and you will become, at long last, your real, divine, stupendous self. This is pantheism. Muller, who founded this religious sort of character at the United Nations, also deeply involved in setting up this worship room in the United Nations. He's a pantheist, believing about God within you and you just have to evolve to find this true God that is within each one of us. And he speaks about this where he says you can become the infinity, you'll become the universe, you'll, you'll at last your real divine stupendous self. Again, this is the same teaching as the self-help industry which leads so many people into the New Age movement. Robert Muller wrote about the World Core Curriculum. The underlying philosophy upon which the Robert Muller School is based will be found in the teachings set forth in the books of Alice A. Bailey. The school is now certified as a United Nations Associate School providing education for international cooperation and peace. Robert Muller's school or the, the curriculum on which the school is based comes from Alice A. Bailey. And this world core curriculum is now being filtered around the world and infiltrating the schools and leading the schools to believe the works as they are according to Alice A. Bailey. If you don't know what I'm speaking about, then think about uh, outcome-based ed education. Have you heard OBE, outcome-based education? Or in South Africa, we have a curriculum 2005 when the United Nations power was so vastly increased. Who was Alice A. Bailey? Do you remember? Alice A. Bailey was a high priestess of the uh, New Age movement. She was also a supposed prophetess. She received her occult writings from the Tibetan Dwal Kul. Or so she says, that was her experience. This Tibetan spirit Dwal Kul, who's actually a fallen angel, a demon, Satan as it were, giving her various information or uh, certain information that she needs to share with the world. And she knew who she was dealing with because she set up Lucifer Trust. And all these books, 24 books of the esoteric philosophy of, of Alice A. Bailey were printed and produced and are become part of this Lucifer Trust, 
with the heat that she received from the public of being called Lucifer Trust, she changed it now to Lucis Publishing. And this Lucis Publishing Company now is the company that prints all the documentation of the United Nations. In fact, the United Nations is based on their founding doctrines are of those of Alice A. Bailey. She says in her book, Discipleship in, uh, in the New Age, I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. She also says in the reappearance of the Christ in her book, she says, first of all, he will come to a world which is essentially one world. So here, Alice A. Bailey is speaking about the coming one. And remember the one that we spoke about with Bono? This is the same one. It's not Jesus Christ. This is the supreme architect or the, the um, supreme being, as it were. The coming one, capital C, capital O. Well, Alice A. Bailey believes in Lucifer coming to give us the light. And when he comes back, he's going to come back to a one world. Interesting, remember the Baal Hadad, always back to the same old, same old sun symbol, just different ways of explaining it. Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad. Look at the United Nations emblem. Here you have the emblem, and here you have an ancient carving of a sun symbol. Does it look somehow familiar to you? The United Nations embodying something like this? Well, Robert Miller said in my testament to the United States, to, to the United Nations, it says, no human force will ever be able to destroy the United Nations. For the United Nations is not a mere building or a mere idea. Now listen, it is not a man-made creation, you see? The United Nations is the vision light of the absolute supreme, which is slowly, steadily and unerringly illuminating the ignorance, the night of our human life. At his choice hour, the absolute supreme will ring his own bell here on earth through the loving and serving heart of the United Nations. Do you see what he says here? At his choice hour, this is Lucifer, at his choice hour, the supreme being will ring his own victory bell. Ding -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding. We won. <laughs> no, the Bible says that Jesus wins. You see, Satan even lies to his own people. And Robert Mueller says that the United Nations has not been built by man. In other words, it's either built by God or it's built by Satan. And Lucifer Trust is, or Lucifer Publishing publishes all the books and the pamphlets for the United Nations. So who's the God, the supreme being that's going to ring his bell of victory through the United Nations? Dwight L. Kinman, he said, Robert Mueller, former uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United, United Nations said, we must move as quickly as possible to a one world government, a one world religion under a one world leader. And we've just identified who that is. Who's the, the God of the one world? Is it Jesus Christ? No, it's Lucifer. And do the people on the top levels know this? Well, from their quotes, you can pick up that they do know it. But do we visually see that they know it? Well, let's rewind back to Bill Clinton's inauguration. Fritz Springmeier from the Bloodlines of the Illuminati says, People that are Christians now but were Satanists recognized President Clinton's signal at his inauguration as a sign of Satan. That seems fairly cut and dried, and it is. Clinton communicated what he wanted to the people to whom he wanted to communicate. The whole affair with him flashing the satanic hand signal only took a couple of seconds. See, they know who they're busy, busy dealing with. They know. Okay, so since George Bush has come into power, some interesting things have started to take place. Here's the Mail and Garden article on 23rd to 29 June 2006. It says, over the past five years, President George W. Bush has quietly claimed the authority to disobey more than 750 laws that have been enacted by Congress since he took office. Remarkably, this systematic reach for power has occurred not in secret, but in public. Go to the White House website and the evidence is there in black and white. This article continues, it says, for example, the renewal of the USA Patriot Act on March 9. In the signing statement, he states that he does not feel bound to report to Congress and would withhold information 
the disclosure of which could impair foreign relations, national security, the deliberative process of the executive or the performance of the executive's constitutional duties. So here George Bush is ignoring se over 750 laws of the American Constitution that have been enacted by Congress. And he's not doing this in secret, he's doing it publicly. Just go and have a look at the website, they say. Not only that, he will withhold information, the disclosure of which would impair foreign relations, etc., etc. Foreign relations, Council on Foreign Relations, CFR. You see, today, the... The terrorists are being blamed for many, many things around the world. They are being blamed for uh, causing insecurity. But there's a deeper level to this whole terrorist idea that is not often recognized. And in order to get certain laws passed, you have to have certain threats valid and available in the world. And this article continues that Bush signed the overwhelmingly supported congressional bill last year outlawing the torture of detainees. On the face of it, the new law was explicit, strengthening what Bush described as values we hold dear. But the signing statement on December 30 carefully undermines that claim. It asserted that the executive branch shall construe the law in a manner consistent with the constitutional authority of the president as commander-in-chief. In other words, circumstances might arise in which torture might still be authorized. Remember, let's just look what the Bible says. The Bible says a second beast will come up out of the earth. This is America. And will enforce worldwide laws that the world has to bow down to the first beast. That's the papacy. Not only that, if you don't bow down, you will be killed. In other words, you'll go through certain tortures or certain things to force you to acknowledge the first beast. These are the times that are coming down the line. You might not want to recognize that this is the truth, but the Bible warns that the times in the end will have tribulation like have never been seen in the world before. This idea of grabbing power, Bush's power grab, is also recognized and resonating throughout Africa. Here's an article regarding Thabo Mbeki, the president of South Africa, regarding his uh, successor, the person who's going to take over from him. This article says, Power has already been pulled from society to state, from provinces to Pretoria and Latuli House, and from legislature to executive. Within national government, it has gravitated from the cabinet to the presidency. The power in this office is now open to abuse. And this idea of the fascist, symbols inside America, where America is a democracy, but it's leaning heavily back on its fascist beliefs. The same sort of noises are being made in South Africa. Thabo Mbeki speaking at a dinner in October 2006 to the South African Communist Party, he said the following. I think there is a general decline in my graph. At the best level, I was described as being intolerant. Then later, a dictator. More recently, I am told I am a totalitarian. And if I follow the advice of my ANC comrades, I am bound to reach the point where I am called a fascist. Well, I agree. And unfortunately, the people on the ground don't know this. And the democracy, this wonderful experience that we've been through, being all being one big co country, is not actually true up at the higher levels. Do you remember what morals and dogma spoke to us about? Albert Pike, the highest Freemason of all time, he wrote about the Templars having two doctrines, one secret and one well-known. The Templars were also the people who spat on the cross and defecated on the cross of Christ, right? Well, the Templars, like all other societies and secret orders and associations, have two doctrines. One concealed and reserved for the masters, which was Johannism. The other public, which was the Roman Catholic. Morals and Dogma explains to us, this book explains to us that the insider, or, or Johannism, you know, St. John the Divine and these two, is actually the outsider Catholicism. But inside, it's secretly Luciferian. Why then on, on March 10th, 2007, did our president, Thabo Mbeki, become a knight of St. John? Here you have one of the articles about that. As you can see, President Thabo Mbeki was made a knight of the most venerable order of the hospital of St. John of Jerusalem. And well, it carries on. And where did he have it done? 
in St. George's Cathedral with full liturgy and full regalia, the cleft cap and the, the whole thing. St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town. And you even see he was uh, made an order of the knight or knights of the order of St. John by the Duke of Gloucester. Interesting how this worldwide system, which we were warned about earlier in this lecture, has got its slimy legs all over governments. And when South Africa became a democracy, we changed our symbols and we now became known as this democracy and our coat of arms also changed. I bring it up for you on screen and then notice a couple of things. Firstly, you see the, the uh, phoenix rising out of the ashes. Can you see its wings are up as it rises out of the ashes? Can you see on top of the phoenix you've got the seven sun rays of the sun god Mitra? This is Mitraism, this is sun worship. Not only that, the, you see the one eye of the eagle. And which eye is it? Again, it's the left eye. Then you've got the triangle underneath the head of the phoenix or of the eagle. And on top you've got the capstone. Oh, there's so many symbols inside our uh, coat of arms in South Africa. It's actually shocking. That's not even to do with the horns of, or the you know, tusks, etc., etc., which has got to do stuff about the Ark of the Covenant. Not even going to go into that. Just on the coat of arms, you can already see there's an allegiance towards sun worship. We've even got a, a uh, province called Mpumalanga, which is there where the sun rises, a whole province dedicated to the rising of the sun. Go a little bit deeper into the orders. When you become, um, or when you do something as a good citizen, you receive an award from the presidency. Have a look at these awards, what's known as the Order of Companions of Olis Oliver Tambo. There you see from their own website the information about it. Can you see the symbol? Does it look familiar? You've got the yin yang, the spinning sun symbol of the yin yang. Not only that, on the outside you've got again the spinning yin yang and then it's all in the shape of an eye. And I'm not saying it's in the shape of an eye. Their own information says Majola, the watchful eye with hooks at both the top and the bottom, is inspired by the universal yin and yang that speak of a meeting point for diverse spiritual entities. This is the highest order that you can receive in South Africa, is the sun symbol of Lucifer, the all-seeing eye. Not only that, if you go to the other orders, you've got various of them. Um, there on the top left, you can see the Baal Hadad. On the bottom left, you can see the sun symbol, the sun rising again. And then this one on the top right, you see the sun rays again, and at the bottom, the, the Baal Hadad underneath. And what about this one right at the bottom? You see, it also explains Ika, Ika Manga, the rays of the sun which denote power and glory and illumination. That's the one on top, there with a coming out of her headdress. And there at the bottom, you have the order of the companions of Oliver Tambo, again, this all-seeing eye, and it's even got the serpent around it. These are satanic symbols inside our government in this wonderful democracy. See, but that's for the cattle. That's for the catechumen, the goyim. What about this Robert Mugabe? What's he busy with? Why did he have to print a new 200,000 Zimbabwean dollar note yesterday or two, three days ago, which is now worth one American US dollar? It might even be Australian dollar, I can't remember, but it's 200,000 Zim dollars to one dollar. What's he busy with? Well, it becomes very clear that he's actually busy with what's called the Hegelian principle. You see, with the layout of the world, according to the New World Order, the world has been split into 10 regions, right? And it, Zimbabwe, all you do, go into the Zimbabwe and you'll see it's now called the Jesuit province of Zimbabwe. He's busy fulfilling a very important role, is Robert Mugabe. He's not, doing, he's not uh, doing a bad job. In fact, he's doing a very good job. He's trying to destroy one country while this supreme power lifts up another country. We happen to be in South Africa, which is being lifted up, and Zimbabwe, which is being pulled down, so that you can have two extremes. You have the thesis and the antithesis, or antithesis. This is Hegelian principle. Then you rub them together again, and <laughs> out comes there synthesis, right? So here you have the image by Gary H. Carr. He explains on route to global occupation exactly that. And there 
between region 4 and region 8, you can see that the border runs between South Africa and Zimbabwe. These 10 regions of the world in the New World Order are also hinted about, and I'll be covering that in a different lecture series. But there's this idea that this first beast, the Antichrist, gives a, a certain amount of his power to these 10 leaders that are put in place. Now, when the Bible speaks about 10, it means all-encompassing. When the Lord wanted to give us some guidelines on how to make sure we are completely covered by His grace, He gave us 10 commandments. The New World Order has split the world into 10 regions. And Revelation 17 verse 12 to 14 says, The 10 horns you saw were 10 kings that have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. So a group of people that aren't kings will be given the power as kings according to the will of this first beast. So let's look for a moment. What does George Bush Sr. have to say about this new world order. George Bush has talked time and time again about a new world order. And this is the best chance to begin to establish the new world order. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. There's a drive towards a new world order from the presidency himself. Remember that Reagan was the first one to be inaugurated facing the sun symbol, that obelisk, and that he was the one to open channels to the Vatican. From there onwards, it's become louder and louder and louder. George Bush said it. What did Bill Clinton have to say about the new world order? There is no longer a clear division between what is foreign and what is domestic. The world economy, the world environment, the world AIDS crisis, the world arms race, they affect us all. Today, as an old order passes, the new world is more free but less stable. Communism's collapsed has called forth old animosities and new dangers. Clearly, America must continue to lead the world we did so much to make. While America rebuilds at home, we will not shrink from the challenges nor fail to seize the opportunities of this new world. There's definitely a new world coming along. And then on January 1st, 2004, shock of all shocks, the Vatican issues its own call. Bomb. January 1st, the New Year message from Pope John Paul himself. Here you have it, CNN.com. Pope calls for a new world order. And it says the respect for international law and the creation of a new international order based on the goals of whom? The United Nations. So here the papacy is calling also for a new world order. It knows that it's going to be the head of this order. And it's calling for these world powers to bring together the children in Christianity and economics and other religions all together under a new world order. The secret societies were planning as far back as 1917 to invent an artificial threat in order to bring humanity together in a one world government, which they call the new world order. That's according to Behind the Pale Horse. This idea of creating a false threat is what's needed to be able to get us to accept certain rights that we used to hang on to, to give them up. David Rockefeller said on September 14th, 1994, the present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built will not be open for too long. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. We just need the right major crisis 
and things will start to be accepted, like the New World Order. Adolf Hitler said that terrorism is the best political weapon, for nothing drives people harder than a fear of sudden death. So this idea of terrorism, and we need some special event to take place to drive mankind to accept the New World Order. That's a bit hard-hitting, isn't it? Well, let's check, because Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld penned out a document called the Project, the Project for a New American Century. This was the blueprint that they would follow when they won the presidency a few months later. Let's look inside this document and see what it says. Our plans will take a long time to accomplish, absent from some catastrophic event, such as a new Pearl Harbor. A new Pearl Harbor? Well, now that the documents have been released, it's common knowledge that they knew, American government knew prior to the Pearl Harbor bombings, they knew that it was going to take place. They let it happen because they needed certain things to take place. And here Dick Cheney and R Donald Rumsfeld say that we need another Pearl Harbor because without a catastrophic event like Pearl Harbor, our, uh, our plans will take a long time to complete. These people are busy driving us, driving us like cattle towards accepting a new world order. If you don't believe me, go and read it up yourself. There it is, the New American Century, Project for the New Amer American Century. Go and read the document on the website. And then out of the blue, interesting to see that that was written in 2000. And out of the blue, September 11, 2001, bam! A new Pearl Harbor, could it be? The terrorists are attacking America, we are told. The day that the world changed. Time magazine shows this explosion as the second plane hits the second tower. There were three major events that day. Number one, it was the Twin Towers, where the planes hit the Twin Towers. Number two, it was the plane hitting the Pentagon. And number three, it was Flight 93 that crashed in the open. Those were the three main events. Trying to uncover what hit the Pentagon has been an interesting uh, exercise. There were three images, still images, of the security cameras that were released by the CIA. They, they, they actually released four, but one of them was black. On the top left you see there, interestingly, that it says September 12, 2001, so the date is wrong. But there you see the Pentagon. Then you see the next one is blank. And the next one, September 12, 2001, you see the explosion and then the bigger explosion. The one frame which this camera should be able to be use to identify how the plane hit or what shape the plane was, etc., is black. Isn't that weird? Well, go on to any of the satellite images of the Pentagon on that day and you'll see something very strange. When a Boeing or an airplane crashes, it leaves debris everywhere. Wings and motors and engines and wheels and you name it. That's everywhere for miles on end. And if it hits in a building like the Pentagon as an example, it, there is just rubble everywhere as this thing explodes, right? Have a look at the satellite image and ask yourself, where's the wreckage? Can you see any wreckage? Interesting, there's absolutely no wreckage. This is a, a graphic which has been put together to show the damage on the Pentagon. There you can see the certain section of the Pentagon that was hit. Do you notice the problem here? That there are no impact areas for the wings. Also that the grass hasn't been churned up. And not only that, that the tail is not, uh, there's no visible damage where the tail hit the building. Something else hit the Pentagon. Something hit the Pentagon that exploded. Not only did it explode, it went through the five rings from the outer ring and from A, B, C, D, E, or C, I can't remember, E, C, B, whatever, right through into the center. You've got a Pentagon as well. There's the hole it made as it shot through these five bomb reinforced walls and super concrete walls as it shot through and exploded into the middle of the Pentagon. They tell me that, on, or they, they explain that what made the hole all the way through these five layers was the nose cone of the aeroplane. Well, that's absolute rubbish because the nose cone 
is of such a flimsy material it gets absorbed like that, even if it hits grass, never mind hitting a building. Very strange, there's no wreckage. Nowhere can we find or identify what hit the Pentagon. What about Flight 93? Here's an image of a plane that crashed out in the open. Do you see the wreckage that's left behind? Do you see the trail? That's the type of trail that should have been left across the lawn at the Pentagon. But there's no aeroplane, there's no trail, there's no burning, there's nothing. It's just disappeared. The same happened with Flight 93, where on the left is the type of image that you should have had. All we find on Flight 93 is a hole in the ground. There the people are walking around this hole, maybe 10 meters in diameter, maybe 3 or 4 or 5 meters deep. A hole in the ground. No debris, nothing. Nothing to be seen. You go to a satellite image and you look back down again and you ask yourself, where's the wreckage of this plane? Somebody took a photo of the explosion that took place when plane uh, Flight 93 hit the ground. Does that look like a fireball that's burning continuously as the flames uh, consume the petrol or does that look more like a missile hitting the ground with a single explosion? If it isn't a missile or some other device, then where's the wreckage? Where's the plane? Where are all the people that were on the plane? I find it incredible that they were able to trace the DNA of every single person on these flights, even though there's no wreckage and there's absolutely no trace of any bodies or human lives. That's the Pentagon. Very, very strange. They could find out all the details, all the DNA, everything of all those people as well, but yet there's no wreckage. The same with Flight 93. What about the main events of the day? Twin Towers. There's an idea that the Twin Towers were hit by these planes and that the heat of this, the, the explosions and the burning jet fuel caused these buildings to implode. Well, there's some very s deep problems with that theory. Firstly, the buildings fell down at free fall speed. What that means is if you were to throw a baseball out of the top of the building, and you were to watch the start of the collapse of these buildings, they would hit the floor at the same time. Now the idea is that the floors caved in one on the other, pancake, 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 as it went down to the ground. If that was the case, they estimate calculating that that would be the case, that this building, just one of them, or both of them in fact, would have taken about 45 seconds to hit the ground. In fact, it took less than 10 seconds for the entire building to become nothing. And also there were 45 steel columns in the middle of each World Trade Center tower. And these had the floors pancake, 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 would have stood straight up. They would have remained firm and in place if the, fo the floors had pancaked around them. These pillars were removed and somehow destroyed in this process. Here's an image which I'd like you to look at from a construction company about how to pool a building. What they, w what they call pool a building is a word that they use in demolitions. They speak about pulling a building. Okay, is the building ready? Right, pull it. And what they do is they press the button and in controlled demolitions, you see the building implode into itself. <laughs> and as this comes down, it's called pulling a building. What do you notice on this building here on the History Channel? Can you see these horizontal explosions as the columns, the support columns are blown out? Well, here's another one. There's a more a vertical image of another building being pulled. Can you see there the two explosions as it pops out of the side of the building, these horizontal explosions, these center columns, the support pillars are being exploded so that this building can collapse? Well, what do you notice on this image of the Twin Towers? Obviously, you see at the top, you see the building starting to crumble, right? Now, there's various things that could have happened up there. But 30 or 25, 30 stories below the actual events. What do you see? Can you see there is a, an explosion, a horizontal explosion? This is where the buildings seem to have had some sort of internal explosive used to remove and destroy the internal structure of these buildings. Over there's another one. Over there's another one how these buildings one by one were imploded. 
There's, I'm going to give you another couple of examples. There you can see these horizontal shootings of these, these, um, the cement as it comes out the side as the various explosions go off. Here are six images from 147 to 203. As you can see, on one level, that, that red square, you can see the one level explode in its entirety before the whole building comes to collapse. Okay, well, that's what the images tell us. But this gives some severe problems because if there were explosions in the World Trade Center, that means that they would have had to have pre-planned explosive layouts. In other words, people, it takes months and months and months of planning to bring down a building. Surely they couldn't have had that sort of access to the World Trade Center. Well, the terrorists didn't, but the Americans did. This is where this becomes sinister. And all we have to say is we know that there were two planes that hit the World Trade Center, one in the South Tower and one in the North Tower. After that, the buildings came down. But were there other explosions? If those horizontal plumes coming out the side were actual explosions, were there other ones? Surely there must be people that heard other explosions? Well, let's find out. These are eyewitnesses' accounts from September 11, 2001. And the question is asked, were there other explosions? At 10.30, I tried to leave the building. But as soon as I got outside, I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. I ran inside the buildings. The chandelier shook. And again, black smoke filled the air. Within another five minutes, we were covered again with more silt and more dust. And then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion, this building might not last. As we were getting our gear on and making our way to the stairway, there was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Some of the people out, then there's those secondary explosions, and then the subsequent collapses. So I don't know how many people were in there. I know there was a lot of firefighters. New York's bravest never had a chance. We really never even got to cl close that close to the building. The explosion blew, and it, it knocked everybody over. The FBI is here, as you can see. They had roped this area off. They were taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. Most of the victims so far were people outside the blown up buildings. Like, it sounded like gunfire, you know, bang, 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 and then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. To me it sounded like, it, to me it sounded like an explosion, then, then the building, the rolling sound sounded like the building collapsed. Where the floors collapsed down. I saw it blow and then ran like hell, thank God. I'm 69, but I can still run. It just went ba-boom. It was like a bomb went off. And it was like, it was like holy hell coming down them stairs. And then when we, we got, finally got to the bottom, they were coming out on a, a mezzanine level there. And another explosion came right from it because everything went flying. We uh, just saw that as well. The second tower, the only one that was standing, tower number one, just uh, we saw some kind of explosion. A lot of smoke come out at the top of the tower and then uh, it collapsed down onto the streets. Next thing we know it was boom boom and the floor started shaking. And then we saw debris fall down and next thing we know we had to get out of the building. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. Well, me and Mr. Hesh, the Corporation Council, were on the 23rd floor. I told them we got to get, get out of here. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the 8th floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the 8th floor. I was making my way to the foot of the World Trade Center suddenly, while talking to an officer who was questioning me about my press credentials, we heard a very loud blast, an explosion. We looked up, and the uh, building literally began to collapse. Rose Arce, one of our CNN producers, is on the phone. Rose, what yes. do you got? I'm about a block away, and there were several people that were hanging out the windows right below where the plane crashed, when suddenly you saw the top of the building start to shake, and people began leaping from the windows in the north side of the building. You saw two people at first plummet, and then a third one, and then the entire top of the building just blew up, and splinters of debris are falling on the street. When I try to say people, in a moment we heard a big explosion coming down. Everything just went black. Everything came down, glass are popping, and people got hurt stuff went on top of them and it was a big explosion and everything got dark real dark like snow you can see behind me all oh, this is not snow it's this is all from the building it was a terrible nightmare because i was down in the basement 
All of a sudden, we heard a, a, a loud bang, and the elevator doors blew open. Some guy was, was burnt up, so I dragged him out. His, his skin was all hanging off. The streets of the financial district covered with debris, in some cases ankle deep. Cars on fire, cars just turned by the force of the explosions. It was like something no one had ever seen. This huge incredible force of wind and debris actually came up the stairs, uh, knocked my helmet off, knocked me to the ground. I was about five blocks away when that, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds and turn around to see the building we just got out of antenna tip over and fall in on itself. We started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if it had detonated. Yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. I go downstairs, the foreman tells me to go to remove the containers. As I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor, that's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion of whatever happened, it threw me to the floor, and that's when everything started happening. You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. Mm. One example, after another example, after another example, Experience after experience after experience of people saying something else was going on here. They're not sure what, but it was like boom, 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 as if they planned to take down a building. Well, you see, that's what exactly was done. In this situation with the, the World Trade Center, with these center columns, these 45 columns that were there to keep the building up, each one of them right through to the top was neatly somehow sectioned off in 10 meter sections, sort of 30 feet, just long enough to get onto a truck. Before any forensics could be done, all the steel was loaded onto trucks and onto ships and shipped off to the far east. Not only that, the entire building was pulverized. That can only take place in an explosion. And then there's a special uh, explosive type device that is used to destroy steel, the foundation of steel. And what it causes is molten lava, or molten steel. And these firemen say, they don't understand it. Eight weeks later, there was still molten steel at the bottom. And yet jet fuel only burns at 600 odd degrees and it needs 1200 degrees to start melting steel. Very strange things took place. Very, very strange. And the people say again and again and again, I was, in I was on the eighth floor and I was rocked to the floor. Where did it hit? How many floors up? Many, 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 many floors. Up in the hundreds, a hundred and something. And here on the eighth floor is an explosion which, boom, rocks them to their feet. There's also images, and I'm not going to put all the video clips in now, of the, the ground lobby area, the ground floor lobby area of these buildings. As the firemen were taking down uh, images of what was going on, some of them walk around with cameras, the news media, etc. All the marble had been blown off the lobby, off the walls. All the windows of the lobby have been blown out. That one gentleman says there was a huge explosion in the lift and he opened the doors and there was this poor man with his skin that was ripped off, etc. There were certain things happening in those buildings which had nothing to do with the planes. And then those two buildings came down, but there was a third building that fell. That's building uh, number seven, World Trade Center building number seven. Here's an image of what happened. It again, what you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down.
gone, man. Back live, we have had little relief here. Take a look at this. About an hour ago, World Trade Center building number seven collapsed. A 42-story building. No word any casualties in the building. It was the one calamity that was not a surprise. It was the one that wasn't a surprise. That's an interesting comment. Can you see how this building falls in on its own footprint? That's only possible if it is done via controlled demolition. A building that falls over, falls over maybe on the one side and then crumples as it leans against another building. This building in perfect symmetry fell into its own footprint. This can only be done with months and months and months of planning and of preparation. Larry Silverstein is the guy who rents out this property. He's the leaseholder, right? He's a gentleman who couple of months before the September 11th, spent weeks negotiating with the insurance companies to uh, protect the World Trade Center buildings from uh, terrorist acts. Not only did he get his way, he got, uh, when, the when the World Trade Center fell, he claimed for his insurance policy, uh, if I can't remember the figure now, it was something like seven billion dollars. Oh, and then he put in a second claim because he said both buildings, that's two separate terrorist attacks. So from his 150 million or whatever he spent on insurance, he got a billions of dollars return. And then he's also the leaseholder for building number seven. And then on national television, when they asked him what happened in building number seven, he says something amazing. Remember, how do you, what do you call as a, person that demolishes building. What do you call it when you demolish a building? Do you remember? They call it, they speak about pulling it. You pull it and then <laughs> everything falls in. Well, Larry Silverstein in this interview, as you'll see now, hints about the idea that there's been so much loss of life and the fire couldn't be contained. But as this video clip starts, just watch the humongous fire which destroyed this building. You'll see it's only two tiny little fires on two floors that could have been put out by uh, just a few fire engines. Watch this video clip and listen carefully to what Larry Silverstein says, the leaseholder of these buildings. So I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Larry Silverstein says to his people, we've had so much loss of life, maybe we should just pull it. And they made the decision to pull it, and then we watched the building collapse. Does that sound like a freak accident? No. These are planned demolitions. Just like Dick Cheney said and Robert Donald Rumsfeld that they need a new Pearl Harbor and that Hitler said terrorism is a perfect example of how to get people to, to be in fear of their own lives. This is what, we sit, what we're seeing at the moment. And in this magazine Facts in German it says, Der Börse sitzt im Pentagon. The evil is sitting inside the Pentagon. On the back of that, BBC World, who's got all these channels and all this information and all these um, videos of 9-11, they, they, they Richard Porter, at least, who's the head of BBC World, he said this fantastic thing on, uh, in 2007, now in, in February. He said, we no longer have the original tapes of our 9-11 coverage. So if someone has got a recording of our output, I'd love to get hold of it. We do have the tapes on our sister channel, News24, but they don't help clear up one, uh, the, the issue one way or another. They've somehow lost all the coverage of 9-11. BBC World? This doesn't make sense. You see, on October uh, 26th in 2001, George Bush signed what's known as the US Patriot Act. Now this was supposedly, or it was um, allegedly proposed five days after the, seven, the September 11 tragedy. Five days 
after 9-11, he puts forward a bill, right? Not only is it virtually impossible to put together a bill that quickly, but to get it debased, debated and passed that quickly is, is not possible. The bill had to be written well in advance and it had to be planned and laid out waiting for a major problem. And when the major problem came, boom, they could justify the passage. This Patriot Act virtually decimates the Constitution's foundations. Very, it, it, interestingly, looking back in eight years, America had three huge uh, tragedies. Terrible things that took place. Waco, Oklahoma City, and September 11. And every time the government of America's answer was that they had to increase their, their governmental powers and their liberties, and, and by doing that, erode the constitutional freedoms and liberties. Worldwide, we've felt this. And so I don't know what you might call it in your country, but in South Africa, we speak about the FICA Act. Now, every time you want to do anything, anywhere, like at the bank, you want to open up a new bank account, you have to prove where you live, you have to have a water and lights bill, you have these new laws where you where they're tracing the money, they now can look into your bank accounts, etc., etc. These things are stemming from the world government coming together. But in order for them to have control of everything, we have to give up certain of our rights, as was laid out in the American Constitution. George Bush said, The best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teaching seriously, is to listen to his words and to put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. America was founded by running away from the Pope. They were running away from persecution. Today, George Bush says, we have to accept the challenge of promoting the Pope's doctrines or the Pope's ideas. And then... History was made when the entire state of America bowed down to the Pope. April 7th, 2005, USA Today quotes the following. President Bush, his wife, Laura, his father, former President George Bush, former President Bill Clinton, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, knelt in a pew in front of the body, bowing their heads. This image was one which had never been seen before. Bowing down, the whole of America, bowing down to the beast. Does this sound like biblical prophecy? The first beast that comes out of the nations and the sea, and the second beast that comes out of the earth, and the second beast will drive the whole world to acknowledge the first beast? The whole world bows down, wonders after the beast. Here those same people, Laura, George, George Bush Sr., Clinton, Condoleezza Rice, and other officials are standing in reverent homage to the Pope as he lies in state. As another image, as never seen before in history. World leaders kneel in homage to the Pope, it says. Vatican City, April 8, 2005. George W. Bush made history yesterday as the first American president to attend a papal funeral, kneeling in silent prayer before the Catholic leader. Not only did these leaders of America bow down to the Pope, but the whole of America had their flags at half-mast. Protestant America, supposedly Protestantism, as it were, lowered their flags to half mask. And this false prophet that we discussed in the previous le the two lectures ago starts to now explain who it itself is. Protestantism has its flags at half mast in America. And then November 14, 2004, this article is written, amongst others, it says, Church and state merge under Bush. Wow, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. As we lead closer and closer and closer to the end of time, the walls between church and state have to be broken down. Various things have to be put in place. One world government has to take place. These things are all underway. And a couple of years ago, just a couple of months ago as it were, George Bush removes the wall between church and state. Church and state merge under Bush. And Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, became Pope Benedict XVI. And he called his new red-hatted men, or men in red hats, his new cardinals. 
And amazingly enough, as it says in the Bible, the second beast, America, will twist and the whole world to acknowledge the first beast. Ratzinger, who was the head of the Inquisition, who founded the, or was the head of the doctrinal issues of the Roman Catholic Church, he gets removed and put in as Pope. Who takes over Ratzinger's position? Interestingly enough, it's an American. Ratzinger takes an American and places him, boom. You remember that 1984 was the first time that America had channels opened between itself and the Pope? Do you remember Billy Graham saying on the interview in a previous lecture, he said, there's going to be some pretty amazing things said in the news about our relationship our, as in Americans or Protestants, our relationship to the Vatican. And here for the first time, the highest official in the Vatican under the Pope is an American. Time magazine says, while Pope Benedict XVI is busy filling the shoes of John Paul II, a quiet American is trying to do the same in Benedict's old job. So the head of the Inquisition, the people that enforced Catholic doctrine, is an American. Washington Post says, Pope names American to key post. Archbishop William Levada of San Francisco, who's 68, will be the highest ranked American ever at the Vatican. He is widely viewed in the church as sharing Benedict's conservative theological and social beliefs. How close are we to the end of time? Very close. What is the final conflict going to be all about? I'm not going to tell you uh, because I'm going to keep that for the next lecture. But here is Pope Benedict in the Vatican, in St. Peter's, having his Mass. And on Christmas Day, the, 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 in 2005, 25th of December 2005, Benedict said an amazing thing. In his Christmas message, he says the following. Men and women of today, humili humanity come of age, yet often still so frail in mind and will. Let the child of Bethlehem take you by the hand. Do not fear, put your trust in him. The life-giving power of his light is an incentive for building a new world order based on just e ethical and economic relationships. A united humanity will be able to confront the many troubling problems of the present time. From the menace of terrorism to the humiliating poverty in which millions of human beings live, from the proliferation of weapons to the pandemics and the environmental destruction which threatens the future of our planet. In his Christmas message, 2005, it's not even two years ago, a year and a half ago, Pope Benedict claims the, the or, or puts out the call for a new world order. He does exactly as what the Pope did just under two years before him. You see, the world is coming towards a one world government, a new world order, where it's going to acknowledge the Pope as the head of, of this religious and secular system. In order to do that, various networks have to be set up around the world to bring this information in to the system so that this big brother idea can become reality. This is not conspiracy theories. This is fact. Watch this clip with me and see whether these, these facilities are in place already to be able to trace all the information around the world. Echelon, which is capable of intercepting all the world's communications at any time. That's all the world's communications, uh, be it uh, police, taxi cab, telephone, television, radio, cell phone, email, the laptops, all the world's communications. Let me show you another clip and it'll expand on this idea. The FBI and the government no longer restricts itself to collecting information about people they suspect of crimes. They have built national databases about every single citizen in this country. You hear about the stories about the satellites who were able to pick up little things on top of uh, Gorbachev's desk and so forth. Uh, well, that's the type of system we're talking about. There are 13 satellites located throughout the world that cover various regions of the world. This sounds very conspiratorial, very paranoid thinking, but the European Parliament has proved that the system does exist, that it is operational, and that these satellites are positioned throughout the world where they pick up communications, electronic communications within each region. 
Once you understand the language, you'll realize that 13 satellites around the world, who's in charge of this? You see, 13 is where this number 6 plus 7 comes from. I'm at 6s and 7s, I'm not sure. This have you heard that statement? I'm at sixes and sevens. The six and seven together makes 13. This is the combination of good and evil. The evil number of six with the good number of God. The right eye, left eye, black, white, the, uh, the dark side, the good side, etc. This is satanic. They're busy building up a system by which mankind will bow down to Lucifer. And their big trump card at the moment is terrorism. Terrorism worldwide. We've got Hanif who's just been locked up in Australia for a period of time and then he's been released because they couldn't find anything. But they kept him for almost a month out of suspicion. Not only that, where they kept him locked up. This is an idea that's not just happening in America where the torture bills can still happen if somebody is jeopardizing America. This is now being filtered worldwide. And then... Once I think, uh, maybe I should just show you this article. Because if you understand the language, then this now will make sense. Remember, George Bush and his government, Cheney, and these Donald Rumsfeld say, we need a new Pearl Harbor. And through terrorism, we can now create the One World Order. Who's going to be the head of the One World Order? Will be the papacy. And then he calls on May 2nd, 2007. He says, Vatican calls verbal attack on the Pope terrorism. Amazingly enough, even the, the speaking about the Vatican is now starting to be identified as terrorism. In other words, what we've been doing and the knowledge that you now have will soon be recognized as terrorism. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do these lectures. What I do know though is that if you have this information and you know of other people that need to get this before the Lord comes, it becomes your responsibility to make sure they get it. The Pope, in, in May of this year, he says, the Vatican calls verbal attacks on the Vatican and on the Pope terrorism, and the world is bowing down to what the Pope says. Therefore, the world will enforce, according to the American system of enforcing, anything that the first beast now starts to say. And then, on the 11th of July, 2007, a worldwide decree was issued by the Vatican that declared, Pope declares Catholicism the only true church. This is a reiteration of what was done in, the, uh, in 2000 where Benedict said the same thing when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, except this time he adds on a little sting on the end of the tail. It says, the timing of the document came less than four days after Benedict revisited another key aspect of, of the Vatican II, reviving the old Latin Mass. Benedict is busy reviving the old Latin Mass, this uh, occult satanic ritual by which you trans, uh, the uh, transubstantiation of Jesus Christ, putting him into the body and blood of Jesus Christ into the Eucharist. We've been through all of these things. If you don't know what I'm speaking about, get these lectures. Fill your mind with this information. Again, a couple of weeks ago, the Pope says, the Catholic Church is the only true church. All other Christian denominations are just ecclesiastical communities, he says. David Spangler, who's the directory or the director of the Planetary Initiative at the United Nations, he says, no one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the new age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. The light that reveals to us the presence of the Christ comes from Lucifer. He is the light giver. He is aptly named the morning star because it is his light that heralds for man the dawn of a great consciousness. Man, these guys are deceptive. Listen to what he says. No one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. You see what the problem is? Worship. They know it. The highest people know that they are channeling exactly as the Bible says. They follow the beast and they worship the dragon who gave the power to the beast. They are worshiping Lucifer. Revelation 18 verse 1 to 4 is this cry that comes from heaven. 
After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings, that's George Bush and his cojones, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed, waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The most difficult thing for people, especially conspiracy theorists, to get around is the idea of what is the actual reason behind the New World Order. It's not about power. It's not about money. It's about worship. Worship of Jesus Christ versus the worship of Lucifer. Luf Lucifer is just using them. And he's using conspiracy theorists as well. If you do not understand the entire picture of grounding your beliefs back in the Word of God, then you run a risk of getting involved in what I, David Icke thinks about this fourth dimension and the immortality of the soul. We've covered all of these aspects through this lecture series that you can realize. This is not conspiracy theory. Psalms 110 verse 5 and 6 is the truth. It says, The Lord is at your right hand, he shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. I don't want to be in Tabo Mbeki's shoes. I don't want to be in Gordon Brown's shoes, Tony Blair's shoes, George Bush's shoes for that matter, any one of the leaders of the countries. The Bible says these people have con come together and spoken against me. They will be destroyed according to his judgment. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 17, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Isaiah 26 speaks about this difficult time that's lying ahead for God's people. Come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. There are momentous times lying ahead, stupendous times. All we know is that Every article and everything that's said either by America or by Rome shows how close we are really getting to the end of the world. In the next lecture, we're going to be landing back on the Bible. We took off a long time ago and it's been a bumpy ride. But now we're going to put it all into context when we discuss the three angels' messages. Thank you.